of a lost empire. I'm meeting with a guy named Mullah Burhan Burhana. He's one of the best experts in this area on the relatively unknown history of the Aksumite Empire. Mullah Burhan? Hi, Dan. Nice How to you meet you. Sir. You too. So this was the center of the Aksumite Empire. Yes. Like Egypt, Aksum was one of the ancient world's great empires for 600 years. From the 1st century AD to the 7th century AD, they mastered major trade routes between India and the Mediterranean and across the Red Sea, exporting luxury goods like ivory, spices, and gold. Proof of the Aksumite's wealth and power is here, a field of over 120 towering obelisks, including the largest monolithic stone in the ancient world, the grave markers of Aksumite royalty. Erected sometime in the 400 years after the birth of Christ, they weigh up to 500 tons, and each was cut from a single stone and hauled here, some say by elephants, from miles away. So these monuments, these obelisks, are massive. Why are they here? They are here to mark tombs for the royal family. Okay. Rising up to 80 feet, each stone was typically supported by a foundation measuring roughly 10% of its total height and bolstered on two sides by gigantic horizontal stones. Surrounding the central foundation are several underground rooms used to entomb the dead and seal away incredible riches. War and lack of resources have made archaeology a luxury in modern Ethiopia, and 90% of these tombs are still unexplored. This is insanely huge. Like the pyramids in Egypt, this elaborately carved stele marks the final resting place for a king who was as formidable as any pharaoh. So these are the windows, these are the beams. So this is essentially the replica of a palace, a royal palace. That's my royal palace. For the royals who were buried beneath it. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. These massive stones were only grave markers. It was in the rooms below that they would spend eternity. Now these are the chambers here. The chambers here. There's ten of these. Yeah. And each one of these chambers would be a, a burial place. A burial and a treasury as well. Oh, okay. Because even before the, ki the death of the king, they were used as a store where they keep the treasures. And after the death of the king, the, the treasures were used for the life after death. So this is like in Egypt. They would build these, uh, these tombs before the king actually died. Yes, exactly. Okay. If you're upstairs looking around at this field, you see stelae, stelae, all these obelisks everywhere in this huge field. Each one of them is the marker for a grave beneath. Only 5% of them have been excavated. Now, they have fully excavated some of these places, but you know who got here first were grave robbers. Many burial chambers had treasure rooms beside them. The grave robbers would make their way into the tomb, then cut a hole through the wall to get to the valuable ivory and gold next door. Imagine what you see is now an empty room filled with ivory tusks, uh, gold, aya, uh, silver, everything that this king would represent himself with in the afterlife. This is how prosperous the Aksumites were. These burial rites ended in the 4th century AD when the Aksumite kings adopted Christianity and a Jewish relic they had possessed for centuries became their greatest treasure, the Ark of the Covenant. Rumors have placed this precious artifact all over the world, but this is the land of King Solomon's son, Menelik, and many believe he brought the Ark home. Legend says it's still here today, in this small church just across the road from the pagan tombs. Living inside that church is the Guardian, a monk whose entire life is dedicated to the protection of the Ark and praying by its side. Ethiopians have been assigning monks this duty for almost 3,000 years. Indeed, in three millennia, no one has been allowed to see the Ark except the guardians. Not kings, not popes, not even heads of state. No one has been allowed inside. By the 6th century AD, 1,400 years after the Ark may have first arrived here, the Western world was in chaos. The Roman Empire had fallen, and Europe was mired in the horror of the Dark Ages. But the Aksumite Empire was at its peak, and just a mile from the pagan obelisks, 
Their Christian king, Caleb, built a magnificent final resting place, a tomb that may have lured the relic hunting Knights Templar, searching for the Axumites' greatest treasure. I can already feel this is a much grander, deeper tomb than the others. Uh, this is the last, maybe, the last Axumite king's tomb. Really? We have, which belongs what to the this? son of King Caleb. This is the room for the grave with three sarcophagus. Right. Maybe for him and for his wife and for his son or daughter. And one sarcophagus is different from the others because it's with a cross, with Axumite hand cross. Huh. Carved in the end there. <clears throat> so we do have one Axumite cross right here. It does look like a Templar cross. Exactly, exactly. But Templars were 11th century, but this is mm. even the Axumite used in the coin in the 4th century AD. That's why we call it Axumite one. This cross, almost identical to the Crusader symbol, predates it by seven centuries. It could be a coincidence, or it could prove Europeans were here looking for the Ark. Many claim the Knights Templar dug for it under the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and searched the ancient Jordanian city of Petra. They may have come to Axum as well. So why did the Templars come here? They know that through the legend, the Ark of the Covenant was transported to Ethiopia. So they came here to search for the Holy Grail and for the, Holy, for the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. So they adopted some elements like a cross like this, which they call it the Knight Templars or the Crusaders cross. Like Fascinating. That. That's where this is from. Cool. Did the predecessors of the Knights Templar come here searching for the Ark? And did they find it? Or is the greatest treasure in Christianity still locked away in a small church in a dusty town? The answers may be lost in time, like the once great but now forgotten Empire of Axum. Everything in this tomb speaks to the height of the Axumite Empire. It doesn't get any better than this. In fact, this king sees the Axumite Empire at its height. After this, certain factors contribute to the downfall. One, the Muslim armies end up cutting off the trade routes, the sea trade routes that the Axumites have used for their great prosperity. It becomes a landlocked state. So all of these factors contribute to the decline of the great Axumite Empire. And what follows are the Dark Ages. Coming up, we find an 800-year-old secret under this church. I'm speechless. You are looking at a boneyard. And later, an underground 9,000 feet straight up. You know what's awesome is that we got to come back down this thing. <laughs> For most of us living in a modern, secular world, we practice our religion conveniently. Maybe one day a week at best, in places not so far from home. But starting in the 11th century, Christians here, and from places as far away as Egypt, made annual pilgrimages to this remote region here in Ethiopia, to a legendary church built within a mountain cave, where many came to worship, and many came to die. In the central highlands of Ethiopia, at an altitude of almost 9,000 feet, lies a scattering of tiny farming settlements. But nearly a thousand years ago, this area is thought to have been a magnet for sick and dying Christians, who came here searching for a miraculous cure, or a peaceful end to their suffering, in a mysterious burial site near a lake of healing waters. The road is very bumpy. No, this is really bumpy. Our guide, Fukru, led us to the holy site that lured thousands here, a church reputed to float on water. And so you're saying that this valley, what I'm seeing now as a, a remote village, just yes, a few yes. villagers, this would have been thousands of people, a kingdom. Yes, imagine what, like thousand years ago, was mm -hmm. uh, lots of people settling here, settling here. In 1087, this was the center of the Christian kingdom of Yemrahana Christos. According to Church Chronicles, he commanded that a church should be built on top of a holy lake. Whew. Wow, that is quite a hike. That's a hike. Well, so that's the cave there? There's a cave. And the church is right inside. Just there. Incredible. Some believe the king was guided to this isolated spot by a vision. But the cave was also a practical choice, 
It shelters the church from the elements.